All right, guys, I thought I'd make a really quick video today since I have a little bit of coffee left and I got a comment asking me to create a video on DOS and I just changed the DAW that I normally use. So I'm gonna give you my perspective which is a little bit technical on all the DAWs that are available today since there's a lot of information on YouTube and it can get really confusing. So hopefully the information that I give you in this video will help you at least a little bit decide on which DAW you should use. So in these videos, the general idea is grab a cup of coffee, you can grab a beer or tea or whatever the fuck you want and spend the next few minutes listening to a guy sitting on a ball, yes, a yoga ball, talking about DAWs. So what I did, I opened ChatGPT and I asked ChatGPT to list the most popular DAWs. And now I have a list of the most popular DAWs and I'm just gonna comment on each and every one of these DAWs and just give you my perspective. And the cool thing about this is that I'm not sponsored by any of these companies and I don't need to promote any of these DAWs. I will just give you my perspective. I may not be right about everything. I don't know everything about every DAW. But I do have experience with a lot of them. One more thing, I will not be discussing the price as much. I understand that different DAWs cost different amounts of money. So basically, um, you can pick and choose what you can afford or if you want to pay at all for a DAW. So the first one in the list is Ableton Live. It says, great for electronic music, live performance, loop-based production. This is absolutely true, but it's worth saying that it is not impossible to do other things in Ableton Live. I used Ableton Live for a very long time now, and the reason why I was using Ableton Live is mainly because it's a lightweight program, it is stable, and it pretty much works all the time. I used Pro Tools before with Ableton Live, like I would use Ableton Live for some MIDI stuff and Pro Tools for like mixing, but then I just figured I would just use Ableton Live and do everything over there. I would say it, it's a great software, but the reason why I moved from Ableton Live is primarily I was searching for something that could handle multi-core processing because I'm not necessarily an Apple fan and I do have a different um, configuration of my PC, so, I was searching for something else. There were some minor things that were bugging me in Ableton Live because the whole software is sort of developed for electronic music and live performance, as it says here, and it's sort of pushing you to work in this quantized way, but there are obviously a lot of workarounds. And um, yeah, for people who are used to using like a typical DAW layout, Ableton Live is slightly different which is not a huge problem, but you get used to it very quickly. I wouldn't count that as a problem, but maybe for some people it would not be the right choice. The second thing in the list is uh, FL Studio. I used Fruity Loops back in the day, kind of tried it, and it says here popular for EDM, hip hop, and beat making, and I would say that this software is exactly used for that and that's a group of people who should be using this software because it has a lot of features that are sort of um, adapted for people making beats especially for hip-hop but FL Studio is much more powerful than Fruity Loops so it's not like a low-end uh, beginners type of um, software it's actual real DAW that can do everything. So if you're in that kind of music, maybe FL Studio would be the right thing. Moving on, we get to Logic Pro, which says Apple's professional DAW, widely used for music production. Absolutely, since I don't use Apple, I actually don't use Logic. I did try it. Logic is great. Like most of these products by Apple, software actually works great. And I can see that a lot of people who are working on Apple stuff they use Logic and there is not much to be said other than that this is the professional way to go, especially if you're working on some type of Apple device. And um, yeah, Logic is definitely the way to go. Moving on, Cubase, a powerful DAW for composers, producers and engineers. Well, Cubase is extremely popular. It's very popular with older people because they're sort of used to Cubase because it's one of the older ones. Personally, I don't prefer Cubase and I will tell you why now. Cubase has a lot of bugs. Every time I would go to someone's studio and uh, for the older guys in the studios, I would just fix around stuff with the software. Just Cubase sometimes just doesn't render as plugins well. The problem is when you develop a software in the 90s and all the way to 2025, you're basically only expanding and upgrading, expanding and upgrading and fixing stuff, you come to a point where stuff gets buggy. Now, as far as I know, Cubase had like a complete overhaul of the engine in 2006, 
I have no idea how that was done, but the fact is, it, I don't honestly like Cubase. It is slow, it is cumbersome, it, it has a lot of bugs. That's my experience. You might be completely happy with your Cubase. I would just never use Cubase. There are so many better solutions than, than Cubase. But I get it, people like it because it's familiar. Now, Reaper, Reaper is, is like, it's like people who drive an Alfa Romeo over here. You either hate it or you only drive an Alfa Romeo. So Reaper is extremely uh, good in the sense because it was developed by some really smart people. It is very uh, modular. It is, again, it is fast, lightweight, it is stable. And I'd say that Reaper is an extremely good solution for people who are into this kind of stuff. Like it's also written here, it's budget friendly. I would say that Reaper is a really, really good DAW. Some people complain it's a little bit like older looking and that kind of stuff but it's like hey come on <laughs> you know it I'd say that that is not a problem because Reaper does things extremely well it is programmed extremely well at its core and that is something that I really pay attention to especially if I'm choosing a DAW in 2025. Moving on Studio One known for its workflow speed and ease of use. Well Studio One is something that I used just on one occasion. It seemed absolutely fine. It seemed like like a newer um, software which was like a little bit more modern at the time. I think I tried it last time like round about like eight nine years ago i'd say that it is a great solution as being like a more modern software but i honestly maybe i'm not right about this but i haven't seen a lot of people use it and then you have this problem where we're coming to the industry standard things if you are working with multiple people on a certain project you sort of have to adapt to the software that everybody is using so you can share the projects and that kind of stuff by the way if you find this information useful please click on the like button and donate your subscription to me because it's free you can take it back any time and check out the slightly technical academy at slightlytechnicalacademy.com because that's my website and i'm creating a community of people who are willing to learn some stuff and there's a lot of great content coming up so go check that stuff out now coming to pro tools something that i actually used before uh, it says here professional standard for recording mixing and post-production yes it is whenever you watch a youtube video a lot of these famous mixers in the studios they would use pro tools the main reason for that is pro tools has been around for like 30 years or over 30 years and pro tools has been extremely good and yeah it kind of is a production standard and it is also not it may be a production standard in some of these studios where people who have been in the industry for a long time have been working and using pro tools which is absolutely fine but they're used to that and why would they change if you are not in that kind of business you are not restricted that you should use pro tools that would be at least my take on it because pro tools has some downsides the first big downside of pro tools it's extremely slow and cumbersome and it has similar issues with cubase because pro tools has also been programmed back in the 90s yes it allegedly had a complete revamp of the engine uh, with version 11 as far as i read but pro tools uh, still is sort of like a slow and cumbersome software which um, i would say that is uh, really inferior compared to a lot of newly programmed DAWs which work better with newer hardware and have support for more modern hardware features and again it's also worth mentioning that Pro Tools is also like really shit for MIDI stuff. It is really great for mixing huge uh, projects and if you have a lot of channels and that kind of stuff Pro Tools is sort of the standard it's very familiar and yeah one more thing worth mentioning is a lot of people don't like the fact that Pro Tools doesn't have VST support because they are sort of it's just the company thing because they're sort of pushing their own uh, plugin wrapper so you're sort of limited to using only um, AAX plugins and uh, a lot of people dislike that so yeah it is a uh, industry standard but unless you're sort of going to um, or working with Sunset Sound or some of the bigger studios I'd say a lot of people don't use Pro Tools anymore. Now we do have Nuendo over here which is something that is sort of like really similar to Cubase 
but uh, I guess it's used by some people who are uh, working uh, in, it's also written here, <laughs> working in game audio and that kind of stuff. Cubase was generally oriented towards, I think it started with Nuendo, I can't remember this now, but it's, it was oriented towards MIDI where Pro Tools was actually a software that was oriented towards actual mixing and that was kind of the biggest difference between them at least when they started when they started expanding on all of this software all of this software basically does the same thing just in a slightly different way and it's really subjective on what people like what people don't like <laughs> Going further, we have the Digital Performer, which is highly specialized for people actually working with MIDI compositions and stuff because it can also display notes and stuff like that. So people using Digital Performer actually know why they're using a Digital Performer. So if you're not a composer per se, usually someone who has some kind of background education and that kind of stuff, um, I guess this software would not be the first choice for you. Then we're coming to the Bitwig Studio, which is something that I switched to and I'm actually really happy about it. It says here a modular and experimental DAW for electronic music and sound design and I would disagree with what's written over here because I'd say that Ableton Live is more like towards electronic music and sound design and stuff like this. Bitwig does everything. It just, it's, I find that it's a great bridge between Ableton Live because allegedly it was developed by people who left Ableton. So it's like the better version, the newer and better version of Ableton Live. It has some of the Ableton Live elements, but then on the other hand, when I tried it, I was like, yeah, it's like somewhere in between Pro Tools and Ableton Live because all the things that Ableton lacked, at least for me, Bitwig seems to have, but it also has pretty much all the features that Ableton has. I understand that Bitwig is a little bit in its early days and doesn't have all the features of Ableton Live, but pretty much it works great. And a thing, main thing why I switched over is because it has great support for multi-core processors and stuff like that, which in practice, at least for my system, end up being much faster, much smoother running. It is lightweight. It just works great. So I'm extremely happy with Bitwig Studio, but I completely understand that people want to run with something a little bit more classic, but I, I didn't even mention all the stuff that Bitwig has, like Ableton Live has a bunch of these like really cool plugins and instruments and that stuff, which sounds really, really great. So um, yeah, I'd say that Bitwig is Currently my go-to and I would definitely recommend it to everyone who is starting out and choosing a DAW for a first time. I, I'd say you don't need to suffer with, with the old software. Just go with the newer stuff and um, support that thing. That would be my take on it. <laughs> And we also have DAWs for specific niches. So there is Reason, known for its built-in rack system and virtual instruments. Yeah, as far as I know, I never actually used Reason, but I know some people who have been using this. This is usually people who work with highly sophisticated instrument racks and that kind of stuff. I, I would also say, like with the uh, Digital Performer, people who are using Reason, there is a reason for using Reason. That was funny. And there is also Traction Waveform, and it's like, I saw that one, I was really impressed. It looked really good. And it also says that it's free on the website. It says that it's completely free, which is something that I was, like a fully featured DAW that does everything for free. Well, it, we don't have any credibility to complain about things like that. It is modern, it looks great, it is free, it does all the stuff that the other ones do, so it is something that for beginners I would recommend. Just try something like this. Try, try these free ones and then see if you need to move on to a different one. And I don't think that anybody should be afraid of moving to a different DAW. I think it takes only, you know, from one hour to a day to sort of um, adapt yourself to the new system. So I wouldn't be afraid of that. I know that a lot of people, especially people who are not into you know, PCs and hardware and that kind of stuff, they're a little bit afraid of changing their workflow, but um, I'd say that's not a huge problem. Be brave about it. I'm Marco, and this has been a really quick video on DAWs, and I hope you liked it. See you.